the most important sentence, three words for me, is actually the title of the chapter. We, we are primates. And I guess I'll be a tiny bit pedantic about this for a second, just to reinforce that this is slightly different than the way most people think about the world. So Delaney, I know you did not mean to talk about this much in your post, had a decent amount of climate angst, which is warranted. <laughs> and uh, there's even uh, there's even people who specialize in that as you know, trying to help people navigate that. But at the end of it, you said, just think, we were primates thousands or millions of years ago. So what I want to say is we are primates, we are still primates. Or, well, Christine, what did you discover in here? That we didn't evolve from the chimpanzees. We... share a common ancestor with the chimpanzees who have also been evolving in their own peculiar chimpanzee way ever since they've been changing too. And so we are classified with the chimpanzees and a whole bunch of other creatures, including like little tiny lemurs and stuff like that uh, in this primate order. Now you might wonder who did that to us? Who put us in the primate order? Probably some bad evolutionist, but no, it actually was Linnaeus. Linnaeus is the person who we can blame for all that kingdom phylum family order stuff, not that all his terminology stuck, but especially his genus species or his binomial nomenclature designation for things like pan paniscus and homo sapiens. Um, but I, I don't always tell when people were born and died, but that's 1707 to 1778, which you might notice he was born and died before Darwin Charles Darwin was ever born, which is in 1809. And we'll be talking about uh, evolution and evolutionary theory in the next chapter. And so I'm pulling a page number from further along in Muckle, Gonzalez, and Camp than we've read yet. Uh, but Linnaeus firmly believed that he was classifying the world according to God's divine order, that he was simply describing the way that God had ordered creation. And so he was not thinking in evolutionary terms, although it turns out that his work has been quite useful to evolution because the it turn, the, the, a lot of the relationships that he was describing turn out to be evolutionary ones, uh, not divine creation ones. But he's the one who's responsible for putting us humans in this larger primate order with other species. So why did he do this? Why did he decide that uh, that humans should be part of the primate order. We should be included with these other creatures. What did he see as the similarities? And here I want to talk about some things that especially occur among the larger primates. So some trends and traits that we observe, uh, most of which are on page 33 of Muckle, Gonzalez, and Camp. Now these appear especially with the, uh, the primates we call the Haplorini, which is uh, starting with uh, the, what we'll talk about on Friday is the New World and Old World monkeys. And then especially with the Caterini, which includes the Old World monkeys, apes, and humans. 
Now, I don't always, we, we won't have to memorize terms very much here, but one of the things I wanted to just point out is the interesting thing or frustrating or liberating thing about anthropology is one day, maybe last Friday, we're talking about these huge human-wide things. And then the next thing you know, we're talking about the number of teeth, the dental formula of the uh, old world and new world monkeys. We're going to talk about some of the evolutionary relationships on, in Friday's class when we're talking about baboons and which creatures are closest to humans. And this class will mainly be going over just the general characteristics of the primates. And then on Friday, we'll talk more about their evolutionary relationships. So what do we see? With some of these larger bodied primates coming from, again, especially in old world monkeys, apes, and humans, we see what is called the reduction of facial projection. So that not so much a jutting jaw and an enhancement in the sight rather than the nose, resulting in uh, the great apes and humans basically all have very similar vision, stereoscopic or can see in three, in, in three dimensions and the eyes are oriented toward the front of the face. Um, in evolutionary terms, this is sometimes called a trading of sight for smell, which is to say that unlike dogs and creatures with great noses, we gave up the goodness of smelling things in order to be able to see things better. And again, this is part of it, something we'll learn about more in evolution, but, but every trait has its ups and downs. You don't just get better and better in every trait. Uh, sometimes you trade in things. You're good in one and bad in the other. The larger primates uh, have grasping hands and feet, so are able to uh, especially grasp tree limbs. And among uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans especially have an opposable thumb. This is remarkably developed among us, and that's what gives us the capability to do what you're doing now, which is writing things down on pieces of paper. But chimpanzees and orangutans and stuff also can do things with their thumbs uh, and, and do grasping things with their hands and feet that well, they're probably better with their grasping feet than we are. We kind of gave that up when we went, went over to walking. We also uh, share with the great apes a very long period of infant dependency. So for some of the chimpanzees and orangutans, it can be six or seven years of dependency on their parents mothers, human beings have extended that out to about 36 years. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. We're all independent now, right? We're in college, out there on our own. What this does importantly for anthropology and for what we talked about in terms of culture is that it in the, then you learn things from the people creatures who are raising you. You need to learn to survive in your environment. And it becomes crucial, not just what you're doing on your own, but what you learn from your group and your parents and your peers. Of course, this will be something that people get really excited about is that in relation to our body size, the large primates have a large brain not necessarily the biggest brain in the world, but in relation to the percentage or mass of the body, it's large and complexly organized. And this happens among all of the great apes, but of course becomes especially pronounced as we get into the human primate. So these are some of the, and like I said, these are uh, basically spelled out in a chart form 
on page 33 of the textbook, which includes some other stuff as well. But these are the things that Linnaeus and others observed and said, aha, lots of, lots of similarities there, enough similarities that even though they weren't thinking about evolution, they classified humans as part of the primate order. One of the things that I most want to impress upon you as you read through all of these primates and the names and the terms and the numbers and the rafting monkeys maybe and all the things that they did is how much diversity and flexibility there is among the, uh, among the, the non-human and human primates. Uh, on page 33, just to start us off, we have variations in movement in the ways they get around, quadrupedal or knuckle walking, climbing, clinging, jumping, brachiation and bipedal. So different, all kinds of ways in which the uh, non-human primates and the human primates can move around. We also have dietary variability, which is uh, some Primates uh, are more what they call frugivory, or eat fruits, can be folivory, eating leaves, and insectivory, concentrating on insects. And one of the things that is fascinating about this is that uh, for a long time, we tried to classify the species of primate according to whether it was frugivory, folivory, or insectivory. But we now have discovered that their diets can vary by group within a species, and so not just all the species does the same thing, and even seasonally or by month, in which they'll move around into various things, and one month eat a bunch of fruit, next month eat a bunch of foliage, and the next month eat a bunch of insects. Now, of course, there's might be some species specialization, but there's quite tremendous flexibility, uh, even in the things that they eat. So you can't, uh, we used to think you could classify primates by their diet, but it turns out more flexible than that. There's also a lot of social variability. So on the one hand, there are groups that are mainly dominated by males. There are others that are mainly dominated by females. There are groups that are relatively egalitarian. That is to say, you don't have male or female dominance. And um, you have uh, a lot of this has to do with, or there's different ways in which they, they mate. So in some cases, the, uh, the males of the species will leave their place of birth and join other groups. In other cases, it will be the females and develop different social groupings uh, around that. Actually, that was something, Cass, you noted. What does that do? What does that help them do? Why? How do they know to do that? It is strange. I mean, it does help them from becoming, as you said, it widens the gene pool, but why are they why are they doing that? That's hard to know. It's hard to ask them these things. They don't they can't explain it to us. Um, and, and you're right, maybe it's it's probably something that they don't know, but that's a, a pattern that they've established over time and you know it, it might change. You might, but maybe it's, uh, oh boy, that's a big word to use, but maybe it's cultural. They think about things and they go off and do different things, but it is, it, it does seem that in some, like I said, in some cases, it's the females of the group that leave and others, the males and in other cases, it gets, gets mixed up, but there's a number of different social groups that they have, and they seem to be able to keep track of these hierarchies or lack of hierarchies and keep track of different individuals over time. Let's see a little bit of, uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to see a little bit of footage of them keeping track of these individual relationships. So 
Yeah. Why? I don't know. Why? Why? I'll turn it to a different why question, which is why we are interested in or why we study uh, non-human primates. Um, let's see. Well, Ariana, where? Why would we do this? What are we looking for? What? What do we get out of this? Right. Think you're over there. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the non-human primates give us clues about our own evolution, behavior, and anatomy of uh, what we picked on Christine about a little bit ago, the most recent common ancestors. So those creatures that led to what we now see out there is as humans, chimpanzees, bonobos, uh, what might studying these primates give us clues about this kind of evolution? It also might give us clues to the way we behave today. So, um, you know, do we share with um, with the uh, with the the non-human primates, different social groupings, uh, the ways that we mix up our gene pool, does that have anything to do with the, the social groupings we see among non-human primates? Uh, Michael Gonzalez and Camp also discussed something which is interesting. If you're interested in getting out of the, the climate angst is that the large, large Non-human primates are very important to uh, to uh, ecological sustainability. Uh, good at seed dispersion in some of the the great tropical forests, and their ability to use different kinds of food and be variable can help us understand uh, food strategies that might be sustainable over time for us human beings, the planet. There are a couple of dangers when we look at uh, the non-human primates. Uh, I think one one thing that we have to be careful of is uh, what do we call anthropomorphism, which is projecting human traits onto uh, other species. And that's why I was trying to be as careful as possible in answering Cass's question about why, because it's hard to say, and I don't want to project human emotions and human reasons onto other creatures. So people do this all the time as they assume, aha, I found them. They're just like us. We're just like them. But the second danger, I think, is the idea that we have nothing in common with our non-human primate relatives. And so this is a kind of, I, there's, you have to navigate between these two extremes, the people who would say we have nothing to do with non-human primates and those who would try to claim that they're exactly the same as us. So if you can navigate between those two, we can come up with, I think, some tentative findings about, uh, about what, what we can learn from the non-human primates. Before we get into some of the non-human primate findings, I just want to highlight some of the people who have helped us learn the most about the non-human primates mentioned uh, in the box on pages 48 to 49, Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, Barut Galdikas. Uh, I will also include Barbara Smuts, who will be reading for Friday as one of the pioneering primatologists you might notice something about all of these people, scientific pioneers. <laughs> yeah. 
Christine's looking at this and uh, she's puzzled. What do we notice about them? Yes. Um, All women, yeah. So we have, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, women in, in STEM here. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe not all for the best reasons. Back in the 60s and 70s, people thought that, you know, when women were closer to nature and this seemed to be kind of this field that they could go into that nobody else wanted to do because it was off just observing. Uh, they could communicate better with the non-human primates. So maybe this wasn't the, the, the best reason, but it, you know, the some of the most amazing breakthroughs and studies were done by uh, people that you may have heard of. Jane Goodall, of course, is still, still with us and still saying important things um, and were truly pioneers in this field. So what do we find? As I said, what we first find and wanted to emphasize the most is how much, how many different species there are, how much flexibility and diversity and variation there is within the species. We will also see variation within species by group. And so there's, there's differences between mountain gorillas and lowland gorillas between different uh, habits of chimpanzee groups. And you also see variation by individuals. So you might see some that are particularly angry and others that are particularly nice. Um, you just see a whole range of behavior, which we can try to make generalizations about, but there's lots and lots of variation. This also, of course, gives us clues about the most recent common ancestor to our own lineage. But we have to be very careful about that. Um, the primates that are with us today have also been evolving. So we can look for characteristics that we think by observing non-human primates would have existed a long time ago, but we always have to remember that they didn't just stop back there. Um, recent politician wondered why there are still chimpanzees around. Like, well, we have common ancestors and the chimpanzees that are around have also been evolving. They may not be like the chimpanzees of six to eight million years ago. And of course, we also see some parallels, maybe in different kinds of uh, patterns of mating and behavior and sociability to our own, our own behavior. But again, we have to be careful. There are some famous books that said that humans were just naked apes. And this would be a mistake as well. As we'll learn about, although we see uh, some tool use among, uh, and that was one of Jane Goodall's discoveries among the, the great apes, uh, the development of tools among the Homo lineage has been much more pronounced and we've been co-evolving with those tools for more than two million years. So we have to be careful about simply assuming that we are, we humans are just great apes who have been denuded of, uh, of, of the hair. Ariana wanted to know which are the closest to us. And the answer is the chimpanzees and the bonobos. And these are two species of Pan is the species name. They're two living species that are both in Africa. One of them we may know better 
They're known as the common chimpanzee um, because there's more of them and we know more about them. And so most of the time when you see chimpanzees, that's what you see. Also known as, I mean, their scientific name is pan troglodytes. And then there's the bonobos who are sometimes seen, who were originally called a pygmy chimpanzee because they seem to be a smaller version of the chimpanzee. It was later discovered that they are actually their own species. And we know quite a lot less about them. They're now known as pan paniscus. Uh, there are fewer of them, and they have a very limited geographical range uh, in Africa right now. Um, what's really interesting about uh, bonobos and chimpanzees is their speciation. They split off about two million years ago, which is after the split between the what would the lineages that would lead to Homo, Homo erectus, Homo, all those things we'll talk about, and those that lead to our contemporary bonobos and chimpanzees. So what I'm trying to say here is any common ancestor behavior, some people are like, oh, let's look at the chimpanzees. And other people are like, no, let's look at the bonobos. We don't really know because there was, again, a speciation split after our own. So if, if the Homo pan divergence split off about six to eight million years ago, the bonobos and the common chimpanzees split off about two million years. Now, I think, uh, Alex, you, you talked about this a little bit, that how chimpanzees make and use tools. Now, by tools, we don't necessarily, we definitely don't mean hammers and saws, but we do mean uh, a lot of uh, things like uh, termite uh, digging sticks uh, or fishing sticks and various things that are, are mainly made out of leaves and twigs and stuff like that. But we do see a form of tool use that is that is passed along and learned from generation and is passed along by group. Chimpanzees uh, are known for having male dominated groups and aggressive behavior. So some of the some of the more lethal interactions both within and between groups are observed among uh, chimpanzees. So people who get really excited about lethal interactions and violence, male dominance get excited about chimpanzees. On the other hand, the bonobos are known for eroticized social interactions. Slightly perhaps exaggerated in Muckle, Gonzalez and Camp when they say that yeah, how did they put it? Said that uh, sex among bonobos is as common as a handshake or hug among humans. That's a little bit, a little bit exaggerated, but they are known. Well, they have been observed to do all sorts. That have an extremely broad sexual repertoire. Uh, as broad as human beings, let's say. They also are known for having a pretty central role for females in the group and maybe even being considered female dominated. So again, we need to be careful here that, that neither one of these are necessarily uh, exactly what our own common ancestor would have been like, but um, there are, there are certainly people who claim we are more closely related to the bonobos than we are to the chimpanzees, but I'd be careful about that. Um, both, in both chimpanzees and bonobo behavior, some of it that we observe has been highly influenced by our own interactions. So by the time we send in primatologists, usually they're habitat has already been reduced. Uh, Jane Goodall says today that if she were to do it again, she would have been much more careful about 
food provisioning. So they left out food so that the chimpanzees got habituated to being able to interact with humans. And so at least some of the things that we see both among chimpanzees and bonobos are in some ways artifacts of the ways that we've reduced their habitat and sometimes kept them in captive situations. So when chimpanzees get really bored in captivity, they tend to be mean to each other. When bonobos get bored in captivity, they tend to have a lot more sex than they do in the wild, which is interesting, but you have to be careful about making too many generalizations about that. The big point for today is that if non-human primates are so diverse and flexible, then when we turn to the human primate, we should be careful of making any kind of generalizations that would say, of course, humans are like this. It all goes back to the chimpanzees or to the bonobos. Um, so we have to realize that when we talk about diversity and flexibility, we already see that extensively among the non-human primates before we even get to our own kind.